Okay, so we're all live in the group now. So thanks to everyone who joins in and listens to us today. Want to welcome Lindsay Kelk to us. So um, Lindsay is a Sunday Times bestselling author and has written 16 books for adults, including, in case you missed it, One in a Million and the Heart series, the Cinders and Sparks series for children, and many, many thousands of tweets which is probably why her newest book is behind schedule. Her work has been published in more than 25 languages around the world and sold more than 2 million books. As well as her witty, funny, char warm and clever books, Lindsay currently co-hosts the award-winning beauty podcast Full Coverage and Titan Fights, a pro wrestling podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. So thanks so much Lindsay for joining us certainly an impressive um list of things you've done it, it always sounds impressive when you read it all out at once <laughs> so thank you for doing that <laughs> and wanted to mention that I have just read always the bridesmaid so I hadn't read any of your books before but um you yeah, really enjoyed this one it's quite a oh. light um book that takes you away from the current situations in life <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. That's good. <laughs> and um, would you like to maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself or about your books? Sure. Um, I mean, where to start? Yes. Um, my name is Lindsay. I am an author. Uh, that is my job. It, it never stops feeling weird <laughs> to say it, but it's always a delight. Uh, yeah, I've been writing full time now. Uh, my first book came out in 2009. Um, and I've been writing full time since 2010. So I've been doing the author thing for 12 years, full time for 10, nearly 11. And I've written 16 books, rom-coms, mostly where I'm at. So like you say, my one goal is just to create something like a positive influence in the world that's, you know, lighthearted, escapist, something that people can just really enjoy. Um, and yeah, my children's series, Cinder and Sparks, is out there now as well. The first book just came out here in the States yesterday. Okay. Um, I think the first three are out in Australia uh, mm. and in the UK as well. So that's exciting. And what age so, group is that? That's it. For... They're middle grade. So if you're reading it on your own, uh, they recommend seven to nine. Okay. If you're yeah. anything like I'm sure we all were when we were younger, <laughs> we could be reading it younger. Yeah. Um, and my friend's kids all love them but they're like four or five but they haven't read to them okay but they're, they're not quite there for reading it themselves but yeah yeah definitely yeah. if you're reading it on your own sort of seven is uh, your starting point yeah okay no that i'll have to have a look at that for always looking for books to buy for my nieces and yeah yeah <laughs> and that's the thing isn't it it's like i feel like i'm always trying to buy books as gifts um, but to find something in that middle age range, the mm. middle grade is where I find it quite difficult because yeah. I don't always, they don't always want to read classics, but all the books that we all loved when we mm. were that age and they date so quickly. Mm. So Cinders was a real treat for me to write because it's very, it's like a modern fairy tale. So mm. it's playing with the idea of Cinderella, but how do we make it more appealing and modern? Um, and you know, we have Cinders saving herself yeah. and as you find yeah. out in the first book can do her own magic and grant her own wishes okay. but they don't always go exactly according to plan yeah so it's really fun to work on that yeah and what was the last book you had out for adults my last adult book was in case you missed it that came out last summer um or last july in the uk i think around then in um australia new zealand sort of mm. late end of my summer start of your summer um so yeah, it was In Case You Missed It, which was a standalone rom-com uh, about Roz, uh, who was someone who had just come back from working away for three years, I think she'd been away, and she came back to the UK to discover that life had moved on without her, like God forbid, <laughs> uh, our friends and family had all sort of, their lives had kept moving, and she came back thinking it would all be exactly the same, yeah, and it wasn't, yeah. um, and then, you know, accidentally sent a text, a group text, went to the wrong fella accidentally went to the ex oh okay uh, and then shenanigans into yeah you can imagine what happened yeah after. yeah no that sounds good um could you tell us a little bit about how you became a writer and is it something that you always thought you would do it's something that i always wanted to do and it's something that i thought i never would be able to do so okay. i am originally from the uk i live in america now 
Um, but I was originally from the UK, from the north of England, in a little mining village in South Yorkshire, like a really tiny village, like six, 7,000 people. Mm. Um, and it was a really small school, and it was not the kind of school where you were especially applauded for being a book <laughs> person, you know? <laughs> it was like, was not the most popular kid in school. Mm. Um, and I loved to read, and I loved to write. I always wrote stories. Like, I was always that kid writing my own stories. Um, just because I love books so much, it seemed like a natural thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I think it does for most readers, but, you know, we get squashed out of us a little bit sometimes. So I had always written as a kid, and it was something I thought I would love to do. Went to university and read English uh, and did some creative writing modules. But again, like, all of the lecturers and all of the teachers were like, no one ever makes a living at this. Yeah. Like, one person in a million, so <laughs> don't get your hopes up. And you're from a mining village, and I didn't go to a good university. It was perfectly adequate university but it wasn't oxford it wasn't cambridge Mm. it was just a nottingham trent small university and i really just came away thinking it wasn't possible because i've been told that and when we're that age you believe what you're told right Mm. like i didn't know any authors i didn't know anyone that had done it so i just never thought i would be able to and i i started my career in pr i moved to london got a job as a copywriter in, in pr um just so i was writing something and through one convoluted way or another, I was working on a project but in my other job in licensing on, um, I don't know if it was big in Australia, I think it was, there was a brand called Bang on the Door, and it was an illustration called Groovy Chick, and it was like this blonde illustration of a, of a little girl, and it was huge, like they stuck it on everything, and I worked for the company that owned the illustration and sort of whacked it on everything, okay. um, and they started making books with mm. Groovy Chick on them, and I worked with the team who was making the books, but on the Groovy Chick side. And I ended up talking to the team at HarperCollins and said, like, I really want to work in books. I really want to work in publishing. How do mm. I do it? And the editor was really kind. And she's like, you know, you need to go back to school. You need to go and get this other qualification. And it just wasn't an option for me because I didn't have the money. It was broke, mm. like a lot of student debt and all mm. that rest of it. Um, so I put it on the back burner until they had a, a position come available about a year, year and a half later for an assistant. So I went to um, interview for that job, which the HR rep told me I couldn't have it because I wasn't qualified, uh, <laughs> which was nice. And I was because I saw the sort of qualifications, <laughs> but I wasn't experienced. I didn't mm. have the experience. They wanted someone who'd done all the interning and all that jazz. Um, and I couldn't afford to be an intern for free. Like it just wasn't a- available to me. Mm. Um, but the editor sort of put an extra word in for me and said, but she's already done the job on the other side of it. So we think let's get her in. So that's how I got into publishing. And while I was in publishing, I was working as an editorial assistant on children's books, on licensed children's books for like TV and film. And that's when I realized like, it's actually, there's no big magic secrets to becoming an author. Like you've just got to write the book. Mm -hmm. And it was being in publishing and seeing books getting made and seeing how they came in and everyone debating them and talking about them, how they chose what to publish that really gave me the courage to try writing again because I hadn't written since uni, like I just hadn't mm. done a thing in mm. years. Um, and that's how I started writing I Heart New York, which was my first novel. I just, you know, was sort of frustrated with work, really missed writing, really missed telling stories, mm. decided no one was going to do it for me uh, and got into it that way. And that was it. And then once the book it came really quickly, the first draft, I wrote it really quickly. And then, yeah, started sending it out to agents and all that stuff all the regular way. But that was it. It was just something I always loved to do, always wanted to do. I didn't do it for years because yeah. I listened to the wrong people. Yeah, that's that's a great story. How yeah, how you came from everyone telling you it was something you couldn't do, and then yeah. Yeah, mm. I think it happens to all of us. I think I still do it now. There are things now that I want to do that I think, oh, you can't mm. do that. Like that doesn't happen to people. Like, and it's like, but they said that about everything. Yeah, <laughs> they say that about everything. <laughs> So, so despite all the people telling you that you couldn't do it, did you have someone in your life, though, who did really encourage you? I was very lucky when I was writing. Um, so I was writing I Heart New York, and I was living with my boyfriend at the time in London, uh, pretty miserable in my job, like, loved working, loved all my friends, loved working in publishing, but I had, I had a boss that I didn't get on with, so I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, didn't have the most supportive boss of all time. <laughs> Um, and it, I knew it wasn't really in my heart what I wanted to do. I was on the editorial side and I wanted to be on the writing side. Um, so I was writing I Heart New York and a friend of mine was staying with us. Uh, she was staying in our spare room because she lived far away from London. So she was sort of 
stay with us to cut down her commutes a few nights a week and she knew I was writing and she basically bullied me into giving her <laughs> the book that I was working on uh -huh. and the pages <laughs> and she read a lot of women's fiction I, I honestly didn't um I never used to read that much commercial women's fiction um just wasn't what I instinctively picked up but weirdly was what I instinctively wrote yeah um so she picked it up and she was like I mean bless her because if it wasn't for her we wouldn't be here but her <laughs> term was it's not shit <laughs> uh, she was like, you know, there's much worse than this out there. You should give it a shot. Um, which I took as praise coming from her because she's not someone to beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, she was like constantly on at me to get the next pages and to get the next chapters. And she wanted to read it. She wanted to read it. She was very invested, uh, which I just took as a massive compliment. And thanks to her, like, yeah, it really encouraged me to get out there and start sending it to agents and yeah. see where I could go. Yeah, that's great that you had a friend like that. Yeah. Mm. yeah i think it makes a massive difference like yeah. now i'd love to think that i would have done it anyway but i, mm. I honestly don't know if i would have I, mm. I might have just let it sit in the drawer forever yeah yeah and could you tell us like the characters and the events in your book are they based on people or um people you know or things that you've experienced or heard of yourself generally speaking no um like in broader strokes terms it's it's not um, a lot of people ask me that because, um, and specifically with regards to the I Heart series, because the I Heart series is about an English girl who moves to New York, and I was an English yeah. girl who moved to New York. <laughs> um, but it's actually, I wrote the books before I moved, which I is can't. one of those weird things <laughs> where it's like, did I make that happen? That's scary. Don't give me that much power. Um, but yeah, the books came out before I moved to America, the first book. Um, so none of it's autobiographical, but like, yeah, I always say none of the characters are based on real people or people I know, but they definitely are because mm. all the people you know sneak in. Mm. You know, like even if you don't mean to, like the events of I Heart New York were all fictional, but even as fictional, my, my friend that read the book was like, don't let your boyfriend read this. And she was right. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, uh, I think this might be about how you want to break up with him. And I at the time was like, oh my God, don't be ridiculous. Clear as a bell a it year was. later <laughs> comes out. Like and I'm like, Oh my god, you were right. Like I was totally breaking up with him in fictional terms. Uh feeling that out. So yes and no. Mm. Um but never really on purpose. Mm. We've got quite a few people watching and got some questions coming through, which is great. So um Mary is wondering what inspires your writing? <sighs> you know, it changes. Um because when I started out writing, it was just trying to come up with a funny idea. I feel like, I feel like, I mean, I Heart New York, it was just, I was just writing for myself and it was just my own personal fantasy. It was mm. like, if my life could be anything, what would it be? And it was like, well, you'd move to New York, wouldn't you? Like, that was it. It was like, I'm 26 and I hate everything. I'm going to just pack my bags and move to New York. And that's how that came up. And then after that, it was just sort of trying to come up with, what I thought was a funny jumping off point. So like I had a book called The Single Girls To Do List, which was about someone trying to work out how to be single for the first time. And her friends helped her write a list because mm. she works best off lists. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's a funny concept. Let's go with that. Let's see where mm. that goes. And then as my career progressed and I sort of learned a bit more about being a writer and what you could actually do, that you are allowed to just write about things you were interested in. Um, that sort of took over and it stopped trying to be things that I thought would be a funny setup and started being what what do I really care about like what do I want to write about what do I want mm -hmm. to investigate and see how this feels so it's it's there now and I think I do tend to hang it on conversations I'm having with friends and and like I spend a lot of time on social media mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it's really good to see what people care about and see mm -hmm. what makes people feel something and I want to write about that because yeah. I want to write about things that make people feel something so honestly everything is is inspiring when it comes to how I've come to getting to the starting point but then it's just like I think a good jumping off point for any writer is like write about the thing that keeps you awake that's yeah. what someone told me once yeah write about the thing that you really care about yeah because you've got to keep your bum in a seat for a hundred thousand words so yeah. <laughs> like, you better care about it before you start yeah yeah no that's good and what about um reviews do you you yeah. said that you spend a lot of time online and that do you look at all the reviews you're getting <sighs> i used to <laughs> and i think the thing is 
is like review culture is so different these days um it's changed so much and i don't know when it happened or why it happened or how it happened but it feels like these days reviews are either one star or five star mm. and it's really hard to find like constructive feedback and constru constructive criticism is everything to an author yeah. like you can't grow if you don't know why, where you could grow mm -hmm. you know like it's no good to me for someone to just be like oh my god i loved it it's incredible 10 stars and i'm like well that's a lovely ego boost but um i'll just keep doing what i'm doing then but yeah. also like i hate this kind of book one star like that's not helpful either because <laughs> i'm like well, what what did you why hate did like yeah. what didn't you like or like was there a character that you felt was weak mm -hmm. or was there part of the plot that didn't connect with you um, so I, I don't tend to specifically read a lot of reviews. Sometimes I'll go to Amazon and I'll filter out to look for those three four star reviews where I feel like someone's actually like really thought about it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like, even if I'm not reading all of them, like reviews are just so important now. Like I cannot thank or appreciate the people that do it enough. Mm -hmm. Cause if you don't get the reviews these days you're sunk it's yeah, crazy yeah. it's wild um and i just think it's a big ask of someone to be like well i asked you to give me money <laughs> like to start <laughs> with and now i expect you to spend your time writing a review as well like that's a lot to ask yeah. of somebody mm. how many times a day do you like open an app and it asks you to leave a review you're like oh leave me alone mm. um so it's a huge ask and it's a huge just drain on people's mental resources but it is appreciated but yeah it's it can be hard it can be hard because it knocks you down it can be hard because it boosts you up it's yeah. just like finding the stuff that's actually going to help you move forward i think is quite difficult mm -hmm. which is why i like social media so much because people are more inclined to enter into a conversation with you about like what they liked about the book yeah. rather mm -hmm. than just one star mm -hmm. <laughs> like, one star hated it I'm like well, why like, you know like, that's, that's, that's harsh um but yeah it's, it's just a review culture is so weird these days that's that's my feedback yeah. <laughs> Cassie's wondering, um, writing for different ages, what challenges you faced with that? Do you know, um, it was probably more challenging to write for Cinder's age group, the first book, um, than my adult books. And partly that's because I've been doing the adult books so much longer. And I, to the, for, most, for the most part, I am an adult. Um, so I'm like, I know what is acceptable. <laughs> Um, and I don't have kids, like I've got a lot of kids in my life, but I don't personally have mm -hmm. kids. Um, so knowing how to write for kids, it's a weird balance because it's not, it's never a case of like, oh, is this acceptable for children? Honestly, having worked in children's publishing for a while and like having godchildren and friends, children's friends, um, friends of ch children that belong to my friends, friends of children and children of <laughs> friends, um, you know what I mean, kids that aren't mine that I know in my life, like, they're so much smarter than I think a lot of authors would give them credit for. And I think yeah. a lot of authors who don't have kids and a lot of male authors can be quite condescending to kids. They're just like, oh, we have to write this mm. to protect the children. Mm. And it's like, uh, kids are really <laughs> smart and they know way more than you think they know. Mm. And you, people think they're putting in these hilarious asides that kids won't get. And it's like, they get it. Kids get all of it. Yeah. And I think about what I was reading when I was nine and 10 and it was like, I was reading all of it um so it's partly like giving kids their due is you, i just don't want to talk down to kids that was it that was the thing i didn't want to condescend and i'm like i'm trying to retell cinderella which has been told a thousand times so how do i do it in a way that respects the kids that's reading it and mm -hmm. credits them with their intelligence because they're already i know they're a smart kid they're reading mm -hmm. like they're reading by choice <laughs> like they're a smart child um and also just really hard to make kids laugh because their sense of humor is so specific but also so weird kids are weird man like they'll laugh at the strangest thing <laughs> yeah. i used to help out in this um volunteer group i used to live in new york i lived in brooklyn and i volunteered at this place that was like a literacy program um for kids from underprivileged schools and they would bring them in and we would do these workshops and we would do this like you know jumping off point of how to start a story and the stuff the kids came up with was just <laughs> always totally wild I'm like, I have no idea how your brain got there, but I love it because <laughs> my adult brain isn't that elastic mm -hmm. anymore. Like it could not reach those places. Yeah. Um, so I just think it's always just giving kids credit, like with rom-coms particularly, which is what I mostly write for adults. I know I'm trying to write 
something that will get you get you in the field you know it's like i want to hit you right in the field and mm. make you believe in this friendship and believe in this romance and believe in these people and aspire to it for yourself like i want everyone to read it to like know that kind of love and emotion and feeling for themselves mm. and and want that and get it from the book and be like oh that felt so great but for kids like they are much more demanding they you can't you can't trick them with feelings yeah <laughs> you can't trick kids with a good kid um so yeah it is a lot more difficult but like so gratifying when you see kids reading your stuff and laughing like yeah. oh so gratifying yeah. And when you first started writing your first novel for kids, um, did you have a group of kids that you tested it out on or? I didn't, I didn't. Um, it was kind of a weird situation because it, it came up, the project came up and then it went away and then it came up and then it went away and the, the editor was like, oh, we might do it, might not do it, we might do it because it was back at HarperCollins where I had worked. So I knew the team and they were like, we really want you to do it. And I'm like, I really want to do it. But it sort of went back and forth for a while. And then at the last minute, it was kind of like, okay, we need to do it. We need to do it right now because we're going to publish it. And I'm like, oh, God. Mm -hmm. um, so I did it really, really quickly. Um, and I think because my editor, he's got little girls. He's got kids of the right oh, age. And I think he was yeah. showing it to his kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but my ego couldn't take it at the time. Like, I wouldn't have been able to do it if I'd shown my kids, <laughs> my uh, god, god, god daughters, and they hadn't laughed. I would have been undone. I would have been crushed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have shown them since. I've got their approval. Okay. Uh, but, That's good. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you find, like, with um, people contacting you with feedback and that, do you, how do you find the number like do you get more from the children's books or more from your adults books more from the adults still at the moment um just i've been doing it longer and mm. like that community is so engaged like it's amazing there's so many people who i chat with online or like i'm just connected with online yeah. one way or another that have been now for years mm. and like having been doing it for 12 years, like I've seen people grow up. I've seen people like they come to the book sign and mm. single. And then the next time they come, they're engaged. And then the next <laughs> time they come, they're married. And then the next time they come, they've got a baby. And I'm like, oh my God, you've lived a whole life and I've written a book. Mm. Like this is crazy. Um, so definitely still the adult at the moment. I, I feel like Cassandra's is that sort of seven to nine age group. I hope those kids aren't online too much because I want them not to be because yeah. I want them to have a life. <laughs> you know, I'm like, um, I see, I've got friends that write YA and their audience is crazy for like constantly being in touch. I get mm. it. If I was a teenager now, I would be online all the time mm. too. Um, but I'd, I'd like to think those seven to nine year olds are too busy playing. Yeah. <laughs> They're outside having a good time. <laughs> or reading your books. <laughs> or reading your book. Like, and then go play. But like, <laughs> just don't be on Twitter. Whatever you do, kids. Get, get off. Get off. <laughs> Kelly's wondering what you like reading yourself and I'm um, wondering if maybe there's anything you've been reading lately that you'd like to recommend to us. I have, I have, I can answer that question and I keep a list on my phone um, <laughs> because I read a lot um, and I tend to, I, I read in spurts so once I start reading I can't stop and I'll mm -hmm. just burn through a book a day and I'll just keep going until I hit a wall or I have to start writing again because I find it really hard to read while I'm writing. Oh, okay. Um, you know, because I like, spend all day writing a book and then you go and pick up a book and you're just like, absolutely not. Like, <laughs> yeah. like not another second. Um, I'm going to watch Friends again. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, so I have. I've been reading quite a lot lately because I just finished my book that's out later this year. Um, I read, I just finished yesterday, day before, uh, Sally Thorne's new one, Second First Impressions. Okay. Love Sally. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just like one of my favorite humans on the internet and just like in general she's awesome and the book was so much it was so lovely it was just like a great big hug mm. um and I loved that before that I was lucky I got a, an advanced copy of the new Taylor Jenkins read who wrote um Daisy Jones and the Six so her new book Malibu Rising I think it's called okay. I just read that that's really good so that's one that's coming out later this year to look forward to definitely pick that up it's kind of like a modern bonk buster it's kind of like a jackie collins like okay. a cool jackie collins because mm. i read daisy jones and loved it and then mm. was like oh what will this be like and i'm like oh <laughs> saucy uh, <laughs> so that was fun and then other than that my favorite absolute favorite book i've read this year is um kazu ishiguro clara and the sun um and he is one of my favorite writers of all time mm. anyway like if you'd like to hear my oral essay of an hour long on the futility of love in Kazushi <laughs> Guru, like, stop me now. Um, but yeah, yeah, Never Let Me Go is one of my favourite books yeah. of all time, and also like, Remains of the Day is just like a masterpiece as well. 
Um, Clara and the Sun to me was right up there, right up there with his best work. I loved mm. it. Oh, oh, I could read it again right now. <laughs> well, thanks for those recommendations. Mary's wondering if you have writer friends that you share your experiences with about your books. I am very, very, very lucky uh, in that I do. I, it, I, I liken it to having like office friends, like your office mm. pals that get it. Because when I first started writing, I didn't know any other authors. Like I was working in publishing, but in children's books, so I didn't know any other adult authors at all. Um, and my part of the the publishing process, like we wrote most of our books ourselves. So as I said, it was like TV and movie tie-ins. So we would write them. We wouldn't have authors do it for us. Oh, okay. We just did it because mm -hmm. you were adapting scripts or making sticker books and, you know, doing that kind of thing. Um, so I really didn't know any other authors at all. And then right after I Heart New York came out, I moved to New York. Um, so again, like didn't know anyone at all, let alone <laughs> authors. <laughs> I didn't know any humans. Mm. Um, so it was really down to social media. It really was like getting on Twitter right at the beginning, like 2009. Um, and just finding that community and I've got to say like so lucky like uh, authors like Paige Toon is a really good friend of mine we always try and tour together our books would used to always come out at the same time um and then obviously with last year being last year no book tours um but we try and tour together because it's so much fun but Paige yeah. is amazing uh Vary McFarlane's a really good friend mm. of mine she's another amazing author mm. um oh god so many Lucy Vine Rowan Coleman, like I will, I will not just go on, but I will <laughs> say, like it's largely female, and that's not a, a knock on the fellas. Love the fellas, um, but it's just a really, really, really supportive community. The women's fiction community, like yeah, that's we all go right. through the same ringer, you know, like we've mm. all been through it. Everyone's mm. working really hard, and I think there is an element where rom com in particular and women writers in particular sort of get, you know, you don't get the oh, she's an author, you get, she writes wrong com. You get a little <laughs> bit of that from some people in publishing. It gets a bit snooty, even though those women work just as hard and do everything that everyone else does. And a lot of them are managing families as well, yeah. uh, which a lot of people aren't. And I think mm. they deserve so much more credit. And it, it, I will say, like, they've just all opened their arms to me as soon as I said help. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know what that's I'm doing. right, yeah. Yeah. They were just like, oh no, come come sit with us. Yeah, <laughs> come sit with us. And I was like, oh my god, thank you. It's not just me. Um, but yeah, it is. It's a really nice community. And every couple of years, like a new bunch of people come along, and they're like, they're in the group. Like, new, mm. Leah Lewis um, is a new author who's amazing. Who you should totally check out. Uh, Dear Emmy Blue came out last year. Her new one coming out this year, Eight Perfect Hours. It's like okay. perfect. It's a mm. perfect rom com. Uh, and she's become a really good pal of mine. Just, I think you've got to do it. Like you, you can't take and not give yeah um, and I think it's a good community for that I think it's all the women authors I've ever met have just been very much yeah that's like, great let me yeah. let me give you whatever you need and <laughs> give it to somebody else no oh, that's great and you said that you just finished your latest book are you able to tell us anything about that I am um it's called on a night like this and it's out in November uh and it's a rom-com if you can believe it uh, <laughs> if i haven't been trying on about that enough. but yeah it's a rom-com and it's about uh, a woman called fran who is a temp she lives in sheffield in england and she's sort of stuck in a rut and gets offered a temp job to assist this famous singer who is attending a charity ball and she gets a chance to um, be her assistant for this charity ball and she gets to go on a yacht and they travel to oh, it okay. together. Nice. And then through various shenanigans that occur, uh, Fran gets stranded on the Italian island on her own oh. without anything to help her and has mm. to go to this hotel to sort of figure out what's happening and uh, has to decide whether or not she's going to crash the ball herself um and then yeah she has she has an adventure that sort of changes her life a little bit yeah so did you write that over the pandemic sort of period and how did you find that because your your books are quite <laughs> um yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry i shouldn't swear um yeah it was awful it was yeah. so hard um i'm a very fast writer like i tend to write in really short bursts of like intensive writing mm. um and I like I like to travel a lot and I like to get around like I lived in New York I live in LA now obviously my family's back in England 
got friends all over the state so I, I like to travel and go and see them so i'll write in like really mm -hmm. intentional verse and then mm -hmm. go and like refill my tank and go and see everyone and get new stories so i can come back and write some more mm -hmm. um and i i couldn't i had to stay in a room yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it was really hard mm -hmm. it was really tough because there was just nothing there it sh i kept thinking like oh it's gonna be amazing and i've got all this time that i've got dedicated to sit and write but to try and write something that's escapist and light and happy and not yeah like, literally when you're the opposite when you're every, locked away <laughs> and we yeah yeah it was really <laughs> strange yeah but um i think in the end it's it's turned out probably to be some of the best work that i've done but it was also the hardest work that i've done mm -hmm. um so i'm proud of it i'm really excited to get it out there but yeah it was hard going yeah. it was really hard going yeah. yeah kelly said your new book sounds a little bit like the nanny I don't, I don't know the nanny. Oh, <laughs> an American, it's an oh. American TV program from the... Oh, okay, is that the Fran Drescher? Yeah, Fran Drescher, yeah. Right? Yes, yeah. no, I do know that. Yeah, yeah. I love, well, I love Fran Drescher, but, like, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Maybe she could make a film out of it. I know she's a bit older now, but you yeah. can still have her. <laughs> Mary says, do you plan your writing or just write as you go? I write as I go. Um, I don't really plan... The Cinders books I planned, weirdly. Um, the Cinders books I did pretty much plan out from start to finish because I think that's because they're only like 15,000 words. So I knew mm. I had to be economical. Um, with my adult books, they're closer to 100,000. So I can, I can waffle. Um, but yeah, I know what I'm doing at the beginning and I have a plan for the end. And that's about it. Yeah. And usually by the time I get to the end, it's nothing like how I thought it was going to be. <laughs> So what, um, how do you start yeah. off, like when you first start, what do you have when you first start off? I'm literally about to start, I was supposed to start writing this week on my next book, um, but I got my vaccine this week, yay, okay. um, <laughs> which was awesome, but also knocked me right on my bum. So mm. like, I, was, I was dead to the world for two days, uh, feeling much better now. Everybody, I, I know like we're having trouble scheduling in some places but yeah. like, we can get it we're all going to get it and then we're all going to be so happy mm. um but yeah i'm just about to start writing so i've been thinking this is like my brewing period i'm like i've put the tea i've put the tea in the pot and now it's stewing like mm. it's, it's thinking about it and like figuring it out um i've written a very brief synopsis so i know a lot of authors will write like a very detailed synopsis i write something that's closer to like a blurb that would go on the back of the book so I'll write something that's kind of like just an extended blurb, like one page or so that I send to my editor okay. and, and get the go ahead. Yeah. Um, Cause like they do like to know what you do, <laughs> which is fair. Um, so I do that. That's done. And now, and now, yeah, just start with a blank page and just like mm. get on it mm. and that's it. Just try and hammer it out now until that first draft is done. Yeah. Hopefully easier than it was last year. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. And do you, are you someone who has a structured day and sets aside a certain amount of time or? No, I'm a monster. <laughs> um, I'm just still an absolute child. Like, it's so <laughs> bad. Um, before I met my husband, I was still living in New York and, like, just lived like, yeah, an animal. Like, honestly, we'd just be, like, decide to start writing at two in the afternoon, would write till three in the morning mm -hmm. and then just sleep the whole next day and was totally just one of those monsters that was like i just write when i feel like the muse has taken me and now i'm like nope that's not you can't do that when there's another human in the house mm -hmm. <laughs> like jeff would like to go to bed at a reasonable yeah. hour <laughs> um, so we did for a long time when we first moved in together i'd be like i'm staying up to write tonight and now i'm like no i'm i'm 40 i'm 40 and i want to go to bed um so i try and be more structured like I, but I can't write in the morning. There's just nothing in me. Mm. I'm so envious of the people that get up at 5 a.m. and just sit and write. Mm. I can't imagine it. I can't do anything at 5 a.m. Mm. If I'm not getting up to go on a plane, like I'm not getting <laughs> up at 5 a.m. Unless it's the airport. Like I have no interest in 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I'm definitely a night owl. And I would happily write into the night if, if I had the energy to do it. Um, but yeah, it's just, I'm trying to be more structured because I think it is a lot healthier. Yeah. But generally speaking, I I am someone that just has to like keep a clear, like I just have to keep my afternoon clear and put nothing else in it or it just won't get done. Yeah. That's yeah. the hardest part to me for writing is 
realizing it's a job mm. <laughs> like it has to be done yeah, yeah. sometimes it feels like fun <laughs> like it's not you know like people actually expecting you to deliver something readable yeah um, but yeah structure is important mm -hmm. Belinda's um, said your titles are very enticing do you get to choose them I do I do and it is one of the hardest parts of the job <laughs> it's so hard to come up with a good title I think that's why I love the I Heart series for so long because I'm like oh, there is it yeah. it's done yeah <laughs> and the first one was so obvious because I just been to New York and was like oh my god that mm. I Heart New York is everywhere mm. um so yeah it's really difficult um in case you missed it was one that sort of came to me quite easily and i was like oh that's a cool title because mm -hmm. i started seeing it everywhere and like on social media and stuff of the in case you missed it and i'm like oh let's introduce that um and on a night like this it's actually a kylie song that i stole from ms minogue which i owe her um, <laughs> and i was i thought of the idea for the book and I was trying to come up with a title and I was just driving the car and it came on because uh, I've obviously always got Kylie on shuffle because I'm <laughs> British. Like, we literally have to have her on. Um, and I was like, oh, it's a perfect title. Um, so that was amazing. But I'm trying to come up with a title for the new one now and it is killing me. Okay. No yeah. idea what's going on. It's so hard. It is the hardest part. Yeah. So mm. hard. And I'm a bit interested in your podcast. Could you tell us a little bit about them? Yes. Um, so I have two podcasts. One is Full Coverage, um, which I co-host with my friend Harry, who is a makeup artist. And that is all about beauty. Because um, before I was a publisher, I worked in PR and we did some beauty PR. Okay. Uh, and I loved it. And I've just always, like, I'm not, I'm not a talented beauty person. <laughs> like, I always want to say that at the beginning of the episode. Like, Harry is our professional makeup artist and I am the unprofessional beauty lawyer. like I'm the one that's cack handed with an eyeliner going like how do you do this um but I just love it like I've always loved doing my makeup when I was a little kid I would always make it for my mom um and I love that we can just like lean on mascara on a bad day you know it's like I'm having a bad day mm -hmm. I can put on a bit of lipstick mm -hmm. get myself out of the house and it will cheer me right up I've just always loved that about beauty and that's what our podcast was it was just like or well, what it is um, it was very much just two friends who love a thing, who want to share that love with the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of started it, not knowing what would happen. And then suddenly it was a thing and we had to keep doing it. Um, and now we're a hundred episodes in. Uh, and yeah, we won Best Beauty Podcast at the uh, Johnson & Johnson Beauty Awards oh, really? in 2019, which was exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you. We, no one was more surprised than us. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, are you sure? Is there a real ones out there run by professionals? Um, but yeah, that's full coverage. And then my other podcast for a total 180 um, is Tights and Fight, which is a podcast about professional mm. wrestling, which is my other love. Like, I love pro wrestling. Like, <laughs> always loved it as a kid. Started watching it again when I was in my sort of early 20s. And when I moved to LA, I had a friend who worked in podcasting and she was like, oh, I've got these mates that are doing this really weird thing. And I was like, <laughs> tell me more. Um, and that's how I ended up getting involved with it through a friend of a friend. But yeah, we once a week sit down, talk about the world of wrestling. Mm. We have a good old laugh. We don't take it seriously at all. Super fun. Um, and yeah, for all the wrestling fans out there, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. So if anyone likes wrestling and makeup and books, I'm the, I'm the girl. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a wide variety of um, things. I try to it? service everyone, Jackie. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to be here for everybody. You want cat content? I've got it. Like, you want to talk about Taylor Swift? Come talk to me. Like, really, I'm here for all of it. <laughs> Kelly's saying that you need to write an I Heart Australia book. Oh, I know, I know, and I want to. Um, I one of my I've only been to Australia once. Uh, one of my friends was living in Melbourne. She lived mm. in St Kilda. Um, mm. God, like seven or eight eight years ago, eight years ago, uh, and eight years ago, I, we had a deal when we were both living in London. It was like, oh, let's spend our thirtieth birthdays together, and then I moved to New York, so she came to New York for my thirtieth, and then she bloody went and moved to Melbourne. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not the same. That is far. <laughs> but I did. I kept up my end of the deal, and I came out. Um, and I had the best time. Like we had the most fun, um, and it was Australian Open time. We oh, went to the yeah. Open. Yeah. went to see the women's final which was like wild and super mm. fun and then we went to sydney for the weekend and i had such a nice time and i've been 
coming back. You know, you're like, oh my God, I'm coming back. Oh my God, I'm coming back. I've been coming back every year since. And she's actually left now. She lives in the States. Um, uh, but all of her friends that I met when she was there, like, I'm still friends with them. And I'm like, oh, desperate to come back. <laughs> desperate to write a book. There's a thousand books to be written. Yeah. Could have written a book just about her mates. They were all mad. <laughs> they were awesome. <laughs> well, I hope, I, yeah, I hope you do get to come back and that it does give you inspiration oh, honestly, to write yeah. a book. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Mm. Could you tell people how they can keep in touch with you and maybe, yeah, and about your podcast and that as well? <laughs> if they want to. I mean, like, if you really feel inclined. Um, yeah, I'm always on social media. So I'm on Facebook, um, Lindsay Kelk. I'm on Twitter a lot. And that's just at Lindsay Kelk as well. And uh, if you really want to see pictures of my cat, Instagram, at Lindsay Kelk. Uh, they are. I'll be looking for your cats. <laughs> <laughs> they are, I'm amazed they're not here. Like I don't know what they're doing. They're usually all over the Zoom. Um, but this is their lazy time. This is their laying in the sun before they get their dinner time. I think. Uh, but yes, come find me. I'm always on social media. Always happy to chat. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. No thanks. It's been great chatting to you today. Oh, it's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you. So and much. hopefully we can have you back again another time. I'd love to chat to you again. Definitely, I would love to. Like maybe yeah. when the new book is out, yeah, I'll, I'll have something good. new to tell you. I wouldn't have left my house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll be exciting. And thanks to everyone who joined in and the questions that people asked. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, everybody.